Ciao a tutti da GGR Studios, il nostro canale è dedicato alle lezioni, recensioni e tutorial sull'audio recording. Vi ricordo che i nostri corsi ufficiali certificati Presono Studio One e su altri software audio sono presenti sul nostro sito www.proaudiolearning.com. Non dimenticate di iscrivervi cliccando sul pulsante sotto a destra e di attivare la campanella per ricevere notifica dei nuovi video caricati. Come molti di voi che mi seguite, ho studiato e continuo a studiare recording, tecniche di mix e mastering, perché lo trovo un argomento affascinante, non ripetitivo ed estremamente creativo, perfetto per affiancare la mia attività di arrangiatore e produttore, e come molti ho studiato sui libri prima che su internet. Provenendo dagli anni Ottanta, prima come chitarrista ho studiato attraverso le VHS didattiche dei grandi chitarristi, le partiture di Hal Leonard per chi le ricorda, per passare poi ai libri di fonia, mix e mastering, soprattutto in lingua inglese. Questo perché studiando negli Stati Uniti negli anni 90 era semplice trovare questo genere di pubblicazioni su ogni tipo di argomento, più o meno professionali, come anche oggi qui su YouTube. Uno dei grandissimi maestri che ho avuto è stato sicuramente Bobby Osinski, forse il più grande didatta divulgatore di nozioni di sound engineer del pianeta con all'attivo 24 libri tra i più letti al mondo, alcuni dei quali arrivati addirittura alla quinta edizione. I libri di Bobby sono sicuramente tra i migliori tools di studio esistenti e che ogni sound engineer moderno dovrebbe leggere almeno una volta nella vita. I miei preferiti e che conservo ancora qui gelosamente sono The Mixing Engineer and Book, The Recording Engineers and Book e eh, Mastering Engineers and Book, anche se poi ho adorato tantissimo e da cui poi prendo spesso spunto per i miei video didattici eh, the, Stud the Studio Builders and Book, vere e proprie pietre miliari della didattica mondiale. Ho chiesto così a Bobby di essere ospite qui sul mio canale e sul mio prossimo corso di air training per producer che si chiamerà How to Listen e che spero uscirà presto ed in questa occasione abbiamo fatto una lunga chiacchierata su alcuni concetti fondamentali del recording ha risposto ad alcune delle vostre domande che furono poste nel mio gruppo Facebook Studio One Pro Italy ma facciamo un breve riassunto per chi non conosce ancora Bobby Osinski. Bobby Osinski è stato prima di un divulgatore full time, un chitarrista, un tastierista, turnista, fonico, arrangiatore, giornalista e tante altre cose. Come dirà lui poi nell'intervista lo ha fatto perché si annoiava spesso rimanendo sempre in un solo settore. Molti dei consigli che vedrete nel mio video provengono dalla sua esperienza e durante la pandemia registrammo alcune parti insieme per il mio canale che vedrete oggi. Quindi la registrazione dell'intervista risale al periodo pandemico di qualche mese fa. Seguitelo con attenzione perché vale assolutamente la pena diventare suoi fans. Ho impiegato un po' di tempo per inserire i sottotitoli in italiano e man mano mi perdonerete ho poi ovviamente ridoppiato le mie domande per aiutarvi a seguire meglio il suo discorso. Prima di salutarci vi invito ad iscrivervi sul sito di Bobby dove troverete tantissime pubblicazioni gratuite quindi pronte per essere scaricate nella sezione freebies tra cui tecniche di mix, mastering, organizzazione del lavoro, plugin in generale, consigli sul business musicale, strategie di marketing e tanto altro ancora, non perdeteli. E per chi invece volesse acquistare i libri di Bobby, Amazon li ha praticamente tutti disponibili subito. Capisco che siano in inglese, ma non arrendetevi perché i concetti sono estremamente semplici da apprendere e molto molto formativi. Fatevi un regalo in anticipo. Durante i giorni della pandemia ho ricevuto molte domande su come registrare, missare o masterizzare in casa. Come costruire un buono studio e come impostare tutto per ottenere le migliori risorse. E come primo passo ho suggerito il tuo libro The Studio Builders Handbook. Dovrei averne uno qua. Vediamolo. Yeah. Eccolo. <ride> ah, yeah. You have one and I don't. No, non ce l'hai? <ride> L'ho preso su Amazon. Amazon. I have some in the other room. Eh. Sono stati molto felici perché ci sono un sacco di informazioni su come iniziare a costruirsi un home studio. 
e ho anche suggerito l'altro libro come Mixing Sound Engineer and Book e il libro Mastering Engineers and Book. Ma ho molte domande da principianti su questo argomento e le domande più comuni ricevute riguardano proprio questo aspetto. Quindi le prime domande riguardano la stanza. La maggior parte degli home recorders, come vedremo, ha una stanza con molti problemi. Vengono dai lati squadrati, dalle riflessioni, dalle finestre, e insomma, eccetera. E come possiamo risolvere questo problema al meglio? Eh, quindi partendo dalla forma della stanza, eh, cosa puoi suggerire ai principianti? Well, a beginner usually can't can't choose what they're going to be using. You know, what kind of room shape they have. They have a bedroom, they have a garage, they have a a room that they use. So it's very difficult for them to really choose something because you have what you have. Um, you're better off with the rectangular shape, but you know, the worst case would be square. Yeah. It'd be a cube shape where it's, you know, 10 by 10 by 10. It's That's the most the common, worst. yeah. <laughs> But it's also possible to make it work. And in that case, what you do is you'd have to make it more absorbent. You need more sound panels. You need more bass traps. So that's really the secret. I'm in almost that kind of room. And it sounds really good in here. So it can be done. Now, that being said, it's not the ideal situation, but, uh, you know, I, I un always understand you, you only have what you have to work with. Certamente. E riguardo uh, porte e finestre? Well, the windows are, are really important. It's very easy to... You, you can't isolate them totally, but you can isolate them pretty well. Easiest way is to get a piece of plexiglass. Usually you need a custom piece, but you know, you, you can get that either online or there's usually a local place that you can get it cut. And then you just place it with some weather stripping on top of the window frame, screw it in, and you'd be surprised how well that works. Now, again, I can tell you from experience I'm two miles away from the Burbank airport. And when the planes fly over my house, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. It's going to be loud. But it's not as loud as it was before. That being said, when they take off in other directions, I don't hear them now like I used to. So it does work, and it does work well. So, so così intendi mettere il plexiglas direttamente sul vetro? Not on the window, on the frame. On the frame. The oh, window right. frame. If it's wooden, it's easy to do. Mm -hmm. Someone just sent me something the other day where there's a, a company that makes an insert that fits right in to the frame. where the window mm -hmm. is, right on top of it. There's a seal to it, and it gives it a good, you know, two inches of, of air spaces, which is what you need. Now, it's more expensive than just getting the plexiglass, but nonetheless, that looked like a great thing and the, the spec out well, but I haven't tried it myself. E riguardo la porta, suggerisci di cambiare la porta o mettere dei pannelli sulla porta? Yeah, I mean, the thing about it is there's usually air spaces with the door. It could be a problem, maybe it's not. The best way to do it is you put a, a solid core door rather than a hollow core, which is what they usually are. But it's absolutely not necessary. It's better off if you have um, weather stripping around it. And again, it's one of those things where if, you know, you have a flashlight on one side and you can see any of the light coming through the other side, then you have a leak and you have to fix it. But isolation is one thing. Isolation is very difficult to get because there's no easy way to do it. But acoustic treatment is fairly easy and fairly inexpensive. So that's what I show people how to do, how to treat the room acoustically, not, not, you know, not how to 
Cioè, Un'altra domanda basic, eh, dovrebbe essere, ci dovrebbe essere un volume minimo per la stanza, ad esempio di riferimento, come ad esempio 85 dB, per, a volte suggerisco di stare ad un massimo di 85 dB per l'ascolto del mix, quindi questo dipende secondo te dalle dimensioni della stanza? Well, 85 dB, you know, comes from the movie world for the most part, and that's what they monitor at. They never change. Uh, television is 82 generally, or 79 sometimes yeah. even. But uh, 85 can be really loud in a small room. So, I, you know, I, I think the whole thing is you have to find a level that's comfortable to you. E secondo te come possiamo cercarlo? Well, I think part of it is your speakers your speakers will will speak the best at one particular frequency or one one level unless you have really good expensive speakers generally speaking the more you pay then they tend to sound the same regardless of yeah. the level yeah. up or down but if you have uh, less expensive speakers there's usually one range that they really sound good at and up or down from that not, not so much so you have to discover what that is sempre riguardo a quello che fai puoi spiegarlo meglio eh, ti ho visto parlare spesso di una tecnica chiamata tecnica dei tre livelli yeah well one of the problems people have is they'll mix something and it will sound good in their studio and they take it to another playback environment and it doesn't sound as good and the balance is off well Obviously there's lots of reasons for that, but I think one way to get around it is using this three level technique. So the first level would be to get your low end together, which would usually be bass and drums, anything that's that's low. And for that you need to move some air, so usually you have to turn that up a little bit. Now if that means 85 dB, if it means 89, you're only going to do it for a little bit, for a few minutes, because you have to move some air to hear what's going on. I made that mistake for a long time actually where I just was not moving enough air to hear the low end. But once you get that, then you can bring it down to a normal level, comfortable listening level and do the rest of the mix there. But the real secret is right at the end, turn it down as low as it will go so you can barely hear it to whisper level. And surprisingly enough, there are balance issues that will show up that you won't hear at a higher level. So suddenly things will jump out of the mix, it'll be too loud or not enough. And if you tweak your balances there, you find that what ends up happening is as you go out to other playback environments, mm -hmm. it's it sounds more balanced, it sounds better. So it's this last step that's really important. Riguardo la riflessione interna della stanza, la possibile correzione Adoro utilizzare RAW, è un software che calcola il valore RT e la risposta dei diffusori. Esistono anche altri software per la correzione della risposta dei diffusori come Sonarworks, Sound ID, esempio, eccetera. Pensi che siano utili o che possano risolvere alcuni problemi? Well, they can't solve big problems. I, you still have to have, I'm going to say traditional acoustic treatment. Some panels, maybe some traps maybe some diffusion Analog combination una soluzione analogica yeah and you know it's a standard thing i know this works so i'm going to, to say this and i advocate it yeah. but there are studio designers that have taken me to task for this saying well this is an old way of doing things mm -hmm. but it still works so that's the rfz method it's the reflection free zone reflection free zone being around around you both on the sides and on top and if you make sure there's no reflections from your speakers in that particular zone around you it will sound pretty good and then if you go the next step and you either make your rear wall soft with absorption or you add uh, diffusion usually the in larger rooms is diffusion smaller rooms is absorption then you'll find that it will sound fairly good and you didn't really spend all that much money. So at that point, then you can go to the room correction software and it will work better. 
Ah ok, è solo per avere una messa a punto del sistema. Yeah. Parlando di ascolto alternativo, negli ultimi due anni ehm, sono state proposte delle molte soluzioni hardware e software sviluppate per iniziare a mixare in cuffia rispetto al passato. Soprattutto ha iniziato ad affrontare la mancanza del ghost center che si ha con i diffusori. E, e si sa che da quando si è in cuffia non si ha il centro perché non, li abbiamo, diciamo, non abbiamo l'influenza della sinistra sulla destra e viceversa. Ma oggi ci sono molti software che possono emulare molto bene questo aspetto e ci sono anche hardware che possono farlo, come ad esempio il monitor della SPL, cioè sistemi di correzione delle cuffie, come i preamplificatori, i crossfeed, il software. Sarebbe un buon sistema per aggiungere un tool ulteriore per gli ingegneri moderni? Penso di sì. Non ero di mixare con i headphones prima, cioè di fare un mixing reale. Uh, but now that there's tools that allow you to do it or at least get close and now there's some great tools uh, the abbey the waves uh abbey road studio 3 i really like but you know they have the ocean way package as well and there's sonar works and there's two or three other ones now yeah ho lavorato con Acoustic Audio, li conosci? Acoustic Audio, you know Acoustic Audio? Yes, yeah. right. eh, hanno sviluppato un sistema chiamato Sien, un nuovo sistema di controllo eh, della qualità dell'ascolto in cuffia. Speaking of that, uh, I'm not using them now because it's just a, a little bit of a hassle mm -hmm. with my current setup in here, but everywhere else I use them. I got a pair of the new Apple yeah. AirPod, AirPods Max. Uh -huh, yes which I think are wonderful. And again, there's a lot of correction going on. There's actually two microphones. Yeah. There's six yeah. microphones outside and two inside. And I found them to be really accurate. Um, I, I've really enjoyed it so far. And even over Bluetooth, they sound really good. Yeah, very Back in the days. Parlando un po' dei vecchi tempi, torniamo al passato, una domanda per uomini anziani come noi. <ride> Quindi nel mio canale il mio obiettivo è quello di educare i musicisti e gli ingegneri del suono su come ascoltare la musica. E, um, prima di tutto perché penso che nessuno possa mixare o masterizzare la musica senza un'adeguata cultura dell'ascolto, così nella comprensione anche degli outboard o dei plugin che cosa ha fatto la tecnologia in, in, al suono e pensando al passato studiavamo e lavoravamo con molte meno cose rispetto ad oggi molte, mol, molte cose in meno giusto un mixer, tre effetti, un po' di outboard niente analizzatori soltanto i view meters nessun monitor con le forme d'onda e solo 100% di concentrazione sull'ascolto della musica eh, ho discusso con questo anche con Alan Parsons. Hai a tal proposito qualche parola su questo? Che è il, qual è il tuo pensiero personale riguardo questo tipo di approccio? I don't miss the old days. I'm not one to look back. I don't have any nostalgia about anything, especially like tape saturation or any of that. I, I didn't like the sound of that back then. Why should I like it now? Um, distortion saturation i mean we try to stay away from that <laughs> so it, it's not something that that i look for now but so things like that i don't look backwards at it and say oh i wish it sounded like that la domanda era riguardo più al meno e meglio yeah yeah i started in the a track days so uh i know all about that and i found it to be a better ex learning experience i believe everybody should learn on a limited number of tracks first because there's a certain amount of problem solving that comes with it and some basic operational techniques, mixing, for instance, mixing things together, uh, for instance, you know, a whole drum track on one track, something like that, that uh, is a powerful experience. And those of us that went through it are the better, much the better for it than now. Uh, making decisions on things, you know, you run out of tracks. What are you going to do now? You know, making a decision on, well, maybe we can wipe this and try something else. Or, you know, I just went through this not that long ago. I, I did a record and um, the artist insisted on doing it in analog. 
uh, on a, a multi-track, 24-track machine. I didn't want to do it, but they insisted. So and we did it. And immediately we saw the problems. And one of the big problems was the band is playing, the band is really hot, it's a five-minute song, and you look over, and you only have four minutes of tape left. <laughs> So you have to r roll it off, and you have to wait until it rolls off, get another reel, put it on, prep it, and by that time, the band gets cold. Of course. So that's one thing that happened. And then the other thing was, I mean, usually what I would have done is track and then you know go directly to Pro Tools <laughs> after that for the overdubs. Yeah. But no, they want to do everything on tape. So um, we get to the point where it's like, okay, what are we going to do for tracks? You want to do one more vocal? You want to do one more guitar solo? Where are we going to put it? So, you know, you run into those things that, you know, everybody has this like golden idea of the way it used to be. And I don't know, it, less is more. It, you know, you start to think of things in advance and how to do things. And I was, you know, the thing about it is I was thinking ahead because I knew how to do it. But the other people weren't so every time you think you have it together and then oh i got an idea i want to try something else oh, sorry iniziamo con le domande da esperti una domanda riguarda i picchi di intersample e quindi sono così importanti come pensiamo oppure possiamo come dire non preoccuparcene because some, well, someone doesn't my, care about that i'm of two minds frankly i I want to stay away from any types of distortion. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will stay away from that at all costs. That being said, I'm within walking distance of two major mastering studios. So I go there and I hang out. I like mastering engineers and I like to see what they're, they're getting. And I'm shocked at the things they're getting in to master, where it's just a flat board top and bottom. There are red overloads everywhere. And at first, the mastering engineers freak out about it. Now they, they're like, eh, nobody cares. They let it go. So, like I say, I'm of two minds of this. I, I, I don't advocate that, and I, don't, I would never do that. And my training is such that I can't for the life of me do that. I mean, I can't. Well, grazie, grazie infinite. Tutti sono ossessionati dai loofs, il volume. Qual è la tua opinione sul mix eh, guardando a questi, a questi meters? I think it's important if you're doing television. That's what it was made for. Uh, and you have to follow it because there's, there's usually a delivery spec that you have to mix to. So there it's really important. For music it isn't. I mean, it, it, it isn't. The most important thing for music is the dynamic range. It's more important than, than the luffs level because it gets changed anyway, no matter what your luffs level, even if it's perfect, if it's, you know, minus 13, minus 16, minus 14, you know, whatever it's supposed to be, you send it to that platform, they re-encode it anywhere. Yeah. And anyway, so... I think it's, you know, there, there's no point. In qualche modo hai già risposto alla domanda, ma un'altra domanda era, pensi che la distorsione armonica sia assolutamente necessaria? Usually no, but yeah, sometimes it helps. The, the biggest example I can think of, and, and the, where it helps me, but it's, it's not that often, but sometimes on a bass, you can't hear the bass in the track. You need to make it speak a little bit better and you add some saturation and it sounds better now you can hear it so th there's a time and place for everything but it's not something that i'd put on right away you know without even listening or thinking about it put put it on like i see some people do uh, you know to me it's it's a final sweetening thing se felice quindi riferito alla fine della loudness war it'll be good if it happens <laughs> I don't know that it is. Uh, I think it's better now, but it, it's still, again, I go and I sit in on the mastering sessions and I see what's coming from major mixers and major label releases. And it, there's no difference. They're, they're as loud as they could be. Si continua comunque a rimanere troppo alti. Yeah.
Okay. Yeah. Come vedi il futuro del mastering rispetto all'uso dell'intelligenza artificiale appunto nel mastering? It's surprisingly good sometimes. I've had some, some reasonable results. I think it can be better than a mediocre ma- uh, mastering engineer. But I don't know that it will ever replace, you know, one of the, the gods of mastering, you know, the Bob Ludwigs or... Bob is amazing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um... That's the whole thing because it's ears at that point. And, and it's also some little tweaks that the algorithm doesn't know about. So, I, you know, I, but I've heard it be really good. So many, I don't use it. I don't use it, but in, you know, in particular, I have just to try it, but, uh, and, and I was surprised it was good. But if I have the budget, yeah, no. of course, use <laughs> <laughs> yeah. somebody real. Diversi mastering engineer si sono spostati verso il mastering in cuffia e altri si stanno muovendo per investire parecchio sul trattamento acustico, sulle DA, eh, sugli speakers, e più di, di quanto si facesse prima. E, o senza un complesso sistema, outboard, spesso alcuni lavorano molto in the box. Well, not the mastering engineers I know. Um, I, I only know... La nuova generazione, intendo, eh? Yeah, yeah. I, I only know the top tier engineers and most of them are it's a hybrid. They're in the box and, and still, you know, outboard. There's one that I know that's totally who's an old school engineer who's totally in the box. Two that I know that are totally in the box. And um you know, their stuff is fine. Mm. It sounds sounds as good to me. So I you know, again, I, I don't think it's It's not the tools, it's the ears. So yeah. however they get there, I don't care what they use. It's ear, not the gear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, eh, le domande so sono finite, so... eh, ma devo dire che eh, vorrei parlare con te di quello che riguarda la tua esperienza di musicista, di ingegnere del suono. E sei uno tra i pochi al mondo che è riuscito a ricoprire diverse posizioni all'interno di questo lavoro. Qual è il tuo segreto? È una curiosità perpetua? Boredom. <laughs> uh, I was uh, a keyboard player and a guitar player, mostly a guitar player for m- most of my early life, till I was about 40. And uh, I did a tour with the famous English guitar player that was not good. And I decided that I wasn't going to do it anymore because of that tour. It just wasn't fun anymore. So I, I, it, was, it was a blessing. It was a favor. Uh, because at that point I decided I, I was going to spend all my time in the studio. I was already in the studio anyway. I was splitting my time. But then I just stayed in the studio after that. But one, of the, one interesting thing that happened was uh, right towards the end of my playing days, I was on a tour bus and uh, the bass player came on and he said, I just got a job writing for the music paper. And the music paper was a, um, it was a weekly newspaper all about music in New York City. It was the hot paper. Everybody read it. And I thought to myself, if he could do that, so, so can I. So I made some calls and I got a, an assignment to write for Mix Magazine. And that, that started my writing career. I was terrible at first. I just saw the, that in, you know, initial article recently. It was horrible. It was terrible. But uh, I got better. And before you know it, I was writing for a dozen different magazines everybody you can think of in the business. And then I, I was, like I say, I, my first part of my life in the studio was as a recordist, and I was good at that, but I was not a good mixer. So I realized that, and I, it was like, well, I gotta find out how to do this. But I knew all the best guys. I, I knew everybody in the business, because I had interviewed them for the magazine, or I worked with them, or whatever. and. Uh, That was the start of the Mixing Engineer's Handbook. And I thought to myself, if I want to learn about this, I bet there's other people that do too. So that started me down another career path mm-hmm. doing that. And that turned into another book and another one after that and another one and another one. And we're not 27 yeah. books in. Yeah, you did uh, a lot, yeah. So I, you know, I've touched on everything. Lot, but much of it had to do with boredom. It was like, well, you know, I've, it's time to do something else. So what's next? Well, I'm doing it. I mean, I'm uh, doing a lot of online courses now. Mm-hmm. I'm in the middle of, of putting together another one. It's an update of 101 mixing tricks that I did. I did that in 2015, so it needs a refresh. But uh, I, I 
ran a contest with my mailing list and I asked them, what should I call this? Should I change it? And I got all these replies back saying, don't call it tricks, whatever you do, because yeah. it's, um, these aren't tricks. So uh, I, a lot of suggestions were secrets. So it's 101 mixing secrets. So my question is over. And, ah, okay. Uh, this is great. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Very uh, much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my friend, thank you very much. I thank appreciate you it. Thank you. you. We'll, thank we'll you, speak Bobby. again soon. Of course. Ciao Bobby. Spero che questo video vi abbia divertito, oltre a quello di Alan Parson che trovate in descrizione, e vi invito a eh, iscrivervi al mio canale attivando la campanellina per vederne altri che saranno disponibili con altrettanti ospiti, amici e colleghi con cui collaboro da anni. Per il momento è tutto, ciao a presto. Spero che questa lezione vi sia stata utile, vi aspetto ai miei seminari, al corso professionale presso il mio studio e nei corsi online e sul sito proaudiolearning.com. Affronteremo i vostri mix insieme e li finalizzeremo nella fase di mastering. Continuate a seguirmi su Facebook, YouTube e Music Off. Non dimenticate inoltre di supportare queste lezioni gratuite attraverso il canale Patreon che trovate in descrizione. Se vi è piaciuto, cliccate subscribe e attivate la campanella. Per il momento è tutto, ciao a presto!